Well, hey, uh, I'm glad to be here this morning. My name is Kobe Wilbanks. I have the privilege of serving as one of the elders here at the Grove Church. Uh, Typically, I get to play the guitar on Sunday mornings. Today, it was a treat to put that down and hear you singing, by the way. I don't know if it's because we're close or what, but you sounded beautiful this morning. Uh, There's something about hearing your voices, singing praises, be thou my vision, uh, just hearing your hearts this morning. So it was a pleasure for me to do that. It's a pleasure for me to to get to preach uh, with you this morning, share the word. Um, If you know, uh, if you've been with us for a little while, you know that our pastor Lance is on sabbatical. Uh, It's our joy to be able to support him and give him a a time of rest for eight weeks this summer. Um, In our church, you know that we have a, a, a large group of men who have seminary educations, right? We actually have seven of them. We have eight weeks of summer, right? So I get to get you this week. Right, we ran out of our seminary people. Actually, I'm a seminary dropout, true confession. <laughs> and so you got me today. So I guess the good news is, is you don't get to hear a long sermon from a preacher today. Uh, that's good, right? The bad news is I happen to be a lawyer. So <laughs> I don't know. Jesus didn't have many good things to say about us as a profession. Uh, so who knows? We'll, we'll see how it goes this morning. Um, but let's recap. As you've heard before, we're in the Beatitudes This summer, before this summer, we spent a lot of time in the Sermon on the Mount, right? And, of course, the Beatitudes kick off kind of the intro to the Sermon on the Mount. Um, And we see several themes, and I want to highlight a couple themes for us this morning that we've seen. Uh, The first is the kingdom of heaven. You've heard that several times this morning, right? The kingdom of heaven is like this. Um, Blessed are, they will inherit the kingdom, right? If you've seen the kingdom of heaven, it's a theme we see uh, throughout that. We also see that Jesus is interested in our hearts. We're going to get to that a little bit later. But we saw that in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to see that in the Beatitudes. We're going to see that today. But so as a lawyer, I kind of think in questions. Okay, so today you're not going to get three main points. You're just going to get a bunch of questions. Uh, and my first question, I had hoped by the time we get to this point in our sermon on the Beat- or series on the Beatitudes, that someone had answered the question, why are the Beatitudes called the Beatitudes? Anybody thought that? Y'all thought that question, or is it just me? It's just me, I guess, apparently. Um, I I had a couple thoughts. One was, uh, I remember back in middle school, the B team, right? Y'all probably didn't play on the B team. I played on the B team. Um, I was thinking, maybe these are the B attitudes, right? The ones that, you know, the B team. There's an A team somewhere, but these are, no, that's not it. Not it, right? Um, I also got to thinking about maybe, you know, the attitudes, these are um, like, like ways we should live our lives, right? Like our attitude should be like this, the B attitude, the attitude should be that. I, no, bad joke, doesn't work. That's not what they mean, right? But the reason they're called to be attitudes, found this out, this is pretty interesting to me. Um, the Latin word, beatus, right? B-E-A, it looks like beat us. Beatus, the Latin word beatus, is what every verse starts out with. The Latin word for blessing is beatus, beatitudes. Ah, makes sense, right? Thinking about that word blessing, we've talked about this word blessing. We have discussed blessing. This is not that blessing of if you do this, this will happen, right? It's not like God will bless you if you are today merciful. It's not what we're talking about. In other places, it's translated, you know this, happy. Happy are the merciful. Or we've looked at it as flourishing, right? We know that, that the Beatitudes, they're proclamations that invite us into a way of living that promise human flourishing. So as a, as a human, living, these way, living the way of the Beatitudes promise flourishing. It's kind of like wisdom literature, if you think about it. Uh, Jesus starts off his Sermon on the Mount with wisdom literature. The idea of how do you live your life such that it's human flourishing. But it's not exactly human literature. It's not all human uh, wisdom literature because there's an element of something to come. Think about each of the Beatitudes we've seen before. Blessed are the more, uh, those who mourn because they will be comforted. Right? There's an element of what will be to come. We're going to see that today as well. So why are they called the Beatitudes? It's great because of blessing. This idea of happy, of human flourishing, how we're going to get there. So today's Beatitude, you've heard it. Blessed are the... Good, good, good. For they will receive mercy. Which begs the question, question number two, of what's mercy? I mean, I think if we're going to talk about mercy, we should probably 
understand what it is, right? What is mercy? Mercy is one of those words that I think I understand until I try to write it down. I think about it. Take a moment. Write down your definition of mercy. Kind of think about what mercy is. Mercy would be, hmm, scribble it down. What would I write down for those of you that don't have a pen anymore? Put in your notes. What is mercy? So my understanding of mercy has always been based uh, in connection with justice and grace. It goes something like this. Justice is when you get what you deserve. I think about like when I'm speeding. If I get pulled over and the, the officer comes to my window. I've been speeding. It's pretty obvious I've been speeding. The officer comes to my window. Justice would be I deserve a ticket. I get a ticket, right? That would be justice, right? So think in terms of, of then grace. Grace is um, getting something you don't deserve, like, like um, unmerited favor, something. So I, I'm speeding. I get pulled over. Officer comes to my window. He gives me a Chick-fil-A gift card. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not right. That's like, that's something I didn't deserve. I actually deserve something else, right? And mercy is that last little piece of not getting what we do deserve, right? So I'm speeding. I get pulled over. Officer comes up to me. Mercy would be the officer, even though I deserve a ticket, the officer, what? I give me a ticket. Give me a warning, right? So that's how I've always understood mercy. But that's not completely, that's not the full story, all right? Jesus is going to walk us through a little bit today that, that pushes us on on what the full story is of, of mercy. Um, so there's an intersection that I drive every morning. Um, and, and for the past two or three months, uh, maybe you know this intersection. We'll put it up here. Uh, but maybe you know this intersection. It's the intersection of Highway 99, Grand Parkway and Highway 90, right? Always floods. Every morning I get to drive this intersection. Um, you'll notice there's, this is, there's two lanes that exit at this exit, right? How many of you have driven this exit before? Yeah, how many of you have driven this, this, this like regularly? Yeah, it's still a lot of you, right? You know that in the mornings especially, what happens to this far right-hand lane? It goes straight and it turns right. Like you can turn right onto 90 or you can go straight on the feeder, right? You know that this interior exit lane is, breaks apart further and actually turns left on to 90, right, to go in towards Sugar Land. So you know if you drive this a lot, in the mornings, this left-hand lane, look, you see the brake lights? This left-hand lane backs up all the way. Like, so you get to ready to exit 99, and if you're at the wrong time, you leave a few minutes too late, you hit, and you're sitting there. Because everybody in that left-hand exit lane, they want to turn left, right? And so the good people of this world <laughs> wait their turn right, in this left-hand exit lane. But there are those <laughs> cruel and ruthless people in this world who go, you know what, there's this right lane over here. Uh, I'll just slip over there, go a little further down, and then, you know, when I get ready to turn left and go into Sugar Land, I'll just whoop, slip right in there. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you are those people. So, I've seen you. I'm kidding. I haven't seen any of you. Um, and so for some reason over the past, I don't know, three or four months, I've been on this personal crusade against those arrogant, selfish, inconsiderate drivers who do that little slip over into the right-hand lane, right? They, they pass up all these kind-hearted, good people of the world. I've been on a personal crusade for justice, right? Because you know what those people deserve? They deserve to miss their turn, <laughs> right? So for about the past three or four months, I've been on this personal crusade for justice, and, uh, and I've, I've administered justice on two occasions. <laughs> That's, and it, it feels good for a moment. Um, I'm driving, and I happen, so I drive a truck, so I, I purposely get over further on the right-hand lane so it's harder for them to see, so they can't cut in front. And then if somebody tries to cut in front, I will speed up or I will slow down, whatever the case calls for. (laughs) 
And there have been two occasions where that person waits too long. They're in desperate need of mercy. And they get to me, and I refuse. And they miss their turn, and I have to go further on the feeder and make a U-turn and come all the way back. And it is joyous. (laughs) Justice is served, right? Like, twice. And then I realize, hey, idiot, you're preaching a sermon on mercy. (laughs) You might want to practice mercy a little more. And the Lord starts... Break it, like, the Lord starts kind of wearing me down on this and going, oh, man. So I start trying to do this. I start trying to show mercy um, in this occasion, right? So, y'all, it's hard. Like, I'm driving to work. I'm going to show mercy today. In a little Mercedes. Oh, come on, man. Anybody but Come in, send me a truck or something. I'll let them in. No, oh, a little Mercedes. Oh, right? We don't, we don't like it, right? And so... But I've been practicing. Um, and then ironically, you know what happened last Wednesday? Um, last Wednesday, there was an accident underneath here. And uh, I was waiting patiently in the left-hand lane. You know what I ended up having to do? I had to get over in the right-hand lane to go past it. I needed someone to let me in, right? I needed mercy. I want you all to know mercy is hard for me. I know mercy is hard for you. But I want to let you know that me slowing down, letting that little guy in front of me is not the full picture of mercy. That's actually the easy part of mercy, okay? The word for mercy here is, um, is this Latin word, or I'm sorry, it's not Latin, it's Greek, elios, right? And it, it literally means, it's translated mercy, but it can also be translated compassion or pity. One scholar put it like this, the word mercy, this word, this Greek word, emphasizes the misery of, with which grace deals. Hence, peculiarly, the sense of human wretchedness coupled with the impulse to relieve it, which results in gracious ministry. All that I hear, and I hear, I see my wife laughing because I can't say peculiarly. Um, All that says, I hear compassion and pity, and I notice, wait a second, that's not an action, is it? That's That's an attitude of the heart. So when I think of the word mercy now, I've got to back up and go, it's not just that action of letting somebody in. Because I can let them in and still have the attitude of, right? Matter of fact, every time I let somebody in, I still have that attitude. So I had to start working on how do I actually change my heart towards that person who deserves something else. There's two parts to mercy. This is what I want you to see. There's two parts. There's an action, right? Mercy, like, implores us to act, pushes us to act. But then mercy, really, the harder part is mercy is our, is our heart, a, a compassion. A compassion for someone who, in some cases, has wronged us. There's a heart piece to this. We'll see a little bit more uh, at that. Um, so the way I'm defining mercy, mercy is a condition of the heart in which we have true compassion and pity for the needs around us, and are prompted to intercede. I'm borrowing uh, a line from Jason Bollinger last week, his playbook. He said, if you put a quote, put a name on it, people pay more attention to it. So I'm putting my name on this like Jason did last week. I thought it was brilliant. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> this is how we're defining mercy today. It's an attitude of the heart, which leads me to this question. Right? If, if mercy is an attitude of the heart, and I'm thinking of the example of when somebody cuts me off, and I want to show them mercy, how do I get my heart to actually be merciful. How do I do it? Is that possible? My first question was, how in the world can I do that? Well, in the world, it's not possible. Right? We can't have an attitude from the heart of mercy, compassion, and pity without God doing something in our heart. All right, so this is where we're going to get to our beatitude, and we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 18. Blessed are the merciful. Why? Why does Jesus say you are blessed, flourishing, or happy? Because of what? You will receive mercy. So Jesus is saying there's an eye towards the mercy you will receive. The reason we can have compassion and pity on someone else is because we recognize that we at some point needed that same compassion, pity, and mercy. We're going to get that. Mercy is the result, not the grounds of knowing God. So there's a little thing here, right? We don't, we don't show mercy so that God will love us. It's a result of God changing our heart, right? So we get to Matthew chapter 18, parable that was read earlier. 
And so I love this parable, um, and then I don't love it. You know, the little lawyer in me gets excited about it, and then I, Jesus, like, drops the bomb on it, and it's like, oh, gosh, okay. So it starts out, you got this king. King is settling his debts, and uh, it says a, a debt is owed by one of his servants of 10,000 talents, which we don't speak in terms of talents, but a talent uh, was effectively... Um, the largest unit of currency of that day. It wasn't an actual, like, coin or bill, but it was the largest unit that they used. Uh, and basically, it was, um, it's like a, well, I forget where it is in my notes. We'll get to it. But it, it was a large unit, right? It was a really large unit. They didn't have a coin. And then, that, then it's 10,000 of those, okay? We'll look at what that actually is. And so this guy cannot pay this debt. The servant can't pay the debt. King calls it in, and, and then this servant pleads with, hey, give me patience. I will repay it. And then look in verse 27. When we see the king forgive him, king says in verse 27, it says, out of pity, the king forgives the debt. All right, see the pity piece? See the heart attitude here? Out of pity, this servant gets his debt forgiven. An insurmountable debt. That servant then goes to a fellow servant who owes him a hundred denarii. A denarii is about like a day's wage, right? So you got a hundred days worth of wages, um, which is, is, it's not nothing, right? It's, it's a, a debt, right? Um, but he goes to him and says, has, hey, pay up. Well, this servant does the same exact thing, right? Falls, pleads, have mercy on me. But this unmerciful servant says, nope, you're going you're gonna to pay me. So I throw him into prison. Um, and then ultimately, word gets back to the king. The king says, wait a second. Um, this is where we pick up in verse 32. The king is approaching this un- unmerciful, unmerciful servant. And he says in verse 32, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have, and this is what's curious. He doesn't say forgiven his debt. Right? He says, you should have had mercy On your fellow servant as I had mercy on you. Forgiving of the debt, the action piece, but also that pity, the heart piece as well. Uh, Of course, then the unmerciful servant, or the the unmerciful servant is then thrown to the jailers to repay this debt, which you can't repay. Interestingly enough, the word for jailers is tormentors. Um, Dive into that one in your free time. That's a little interesting. Um, But then in verse 35, Jesus takes it really, really deep. Remember, this is this is a context of Jesus talking about forgiveness. Um, and so he tell, he's giving you a math problem. How many times do we forgive? 70 times 7. And then he tells a story, a parable. And at the end of this parable, he drops a bomb. Look what he says in 35. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, throwing you into prison to the tormentors, if you don't forgive your brother. And read those last three words. From the heart. So you mean it's not good enough for me just to forgive a debt? To let that driver in, but I've actually got to forgive them from my heart. That's impossible, is it not? It is without Christ. I do want to illustrate something for you, though. This debt, I think there's something we, we lose in translation. Um, we don't speak in terms of talents, do we? No, we don't speak in terms of talents. Um, and so we really have no concept of how big a talent is. I couldn't even tell you. The conversion, whether it was like a hundred years' wages or whatever it was, um, but uh, I want to I want to I want to work this out for you. All right, you can't see this. This is a bag. In the bag is a grain and a part of rice. Okay, so my conversion today: a uh, hundred denarii, uh, a day's wages, a hundred days' wages, about twelve grand. Okay, this is the the conversion rate if you use like fifteen dollars a day, the average, or fifteen dollars an hour times an average number of hours, right? You get about $12,000 is what 100 denarii would amount to. I'm going to say that that every grain of rice is $10,000, so $12,000 is a grain of rice plus a little bit. You with me? All right, so here's what I want you to to, to get to. That's my um, 100 denarii right there. You can't see it, but that's on purpose because it's little, right? All right, so a talent. A talent would be the equivalent of, here it is, about 20 years wages for a laborer. So if you do this, you do the math, right? You use the same conversion rate, $15 an hour, average number of hours a day. You end up getting $30,000 a year, 
20 years' wages was about $600,000, right? One talent, $600,000. But Jesus doesn't say one talent, does he? How many does he say? 10,000. Some of you are doing the math. Some of you are waiting for me to tell you the answer. Six billion dollars. Okay, six billion dollars, right? Well, okay, you don't, millions, billions, it's all the same, right? All right, so let's just try to figure out six billion. If, if every grain of rice is $10,000, how many grains of rice is going to get six billion dollars, right? The equivalent of 10,000. All right, let's see. Right. Let me give you a hint, right? This is a thousand grains of rice. You don't believe me? Come count it afterwards if you find. It. I don't care. <laughs> a thousand grains of rice. A thousand grains of rice. About ten mil. Cool ten mil right here. Right? Okay. Leave that there. Uh, this is a pound of rice. Pound of rice. Anybody know how many grains are in here? More than one. Okay. Good answer. Um, I didn't count them. I weighed them. Uh, my father's a science teacher. I'm very grateful for his uh, skills and influence in my life. Um, about 25,000 grains, which is about 250 million. 250 million right here, right? How many pounds, then, of rice do we need to get 6 billion? Anybody know? Is it one pound? Two pounds? Y'all going to help me out? Y'all just going to watch. It's a lot. Nobody's figured out the math yet. Three pounds. Four pounds. Four pounds, 250 million, gets me what, y'all? One billion dollars. We didn't say one billion. We said how many? We did six billion dollars, right? So if four is one, six times four is twenty-four pounds of rice. Six billion dollars. Jesus, look at this illustration, y'all. How appropriate. Look at this illustration. Jesus says, look. You got a servant who owed a king six billion dollars. King had pity, had mercy, forgave it, right? But then that servant who's been forgiven of all this was owed this, right? And I can't help but think Jesus is making the connection with us, right? Jesus is making the connection with us. What, what are we hanging on to? Those debts that we are owed. We forget the mercy that God has given us. I think that's where he's going with us. All right? So how can we as Christians be truly merciful? We can be merciful from the heart because we've received this. We've received great mercy. We've had a, an enormous debt erased. Remember, it's not just the debt, though. It's the compassion. It's the, it's the pity. It's the attitude of a heart. We had a king who saw our, you remember that, that quote, misery, right? When you're under a debt like this, like you can't pay it. There's misery associated with it. A king had compassion, pity, and forgave that. Right? There's a heart and an action. We can live under that. We can be merciful because we've been shown great mercy, which then begs the next question. Why aren't we merciful? Yes, I'm assuming we're not merciful, some of us are merciful on some days. But why aren't we merciful? Like, we've just been forgiven $6 billion. A couple, couple thoughts. One is we got a small view of this. Like this. This is not the way we view God's mercy. We view it, it's probably because um, we, we view our sin as, eh, it's not so bad. Right? It, it's really not that bad. That debt that we owe God, man, nah, it's really not that bad. And we also view God's holiness it's really not that different than our own. We use, in our, in our church, we use what's called the cross chart. It's from the Gospel Center Life. And it illustrates this picture of there's a point in our lives where we're converted, right? Where we come to an understanding of what the gospel is. And at some point, we realize God is holy. I have sin, and I need the cross to bridge that gap. But as we grow in our faith, we begin to understand that God's holiness is actually a bigger deal than I realize it. And we realize that our sin is actually a bigger deal. And so as we grow in an understanding of the gospel, that cross becomes what? 
larger. It becomes huge, right? I think some of the times we don't, we, we, we don't, we're not as merciful as we need to be because we have a small view of God's mercy. Either because we don't see God as holy as he is. We don't have a cool understanding of that holiness. Or we have, or probably both, we don't understand the depth of our sin. Okay? I think that's part of the reason. Which I guess is the question, right? What, what does our sin cost? We all know the verse, Romans 6, 23, for the wages, the cost. Wages, right? We're still talking money. No re- you wonder why Jesus used money, right? The wages of sin is, that. do we really believe our sin is like, we deserve death? I don't, I don't know that we do. We don't appreciate the gravity of our sin. We don't understand the holiness of God. Um, but there's a question, though, here, and I, this, this has bothered me a little bit. Why is this debt so much bigger than this debt? Think about it. The king and a servant. The servant had this big debt. Why, why do you think Jesus used such a big, it's a hyperbole. Why do you think Jesus used such a big hyperbole? I think it has to do with the fact of, of who the debt is owed. Think about this. The first debt, this big debt, was owed to who? The king. The second debt, this little cute debt, was between who? Fellow servants. When we think of mercy, when we think of us being offended, we're offended by who? Fellow humans. Right? Somebody cuts me off, I'm offended by that guy. Right? But when we sin against God, we have offended not a fellow human, but an almighty creator king. And so I think sometimes we fail to understand that our, our, an offense against me as a person is vastly different than our sin against God. You've got to realize that that's different. And so how can I give mercy to a person? Because I realize that, man, when he offends me, this is what I'm looking at. But when I offend God, this is what I'm looking at. The, the, the other part of that, and I don't want to make light of sin against a neighbor, right? Because I don't want to encourage you to go out and go, well, I'm going to punch you in the face because it's just a, ring, it's a grain of rice. The other part of that, though, is your sin against me. But that person, if you were to punch me in the face, your sin against me is a grain of rice. But your sin against God now is part of this lump sum over here, right? And so we can have mercy because we realize we've been forgiven of this. That offending party towards us is little bitty. But that offending party also has a debt with which he can't be paid. How do, we, how do we grow pity and compassion in our heart? We realize that the person that offends us also has a big debt, a crushing debt that they can't pay without the abounding mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we undervalue God's mercy. Here's the part here, too. I think we like justice. We view ourselves as arbiters of God's justice. Somebody cuts me off, and they need to learn a lesson. They need justice. Because without justice, they're not going to learn anything. Funny, I don't really ever recall Jesus telling us to, you know, enforce mercy or enforce justice. Matter of fact, I see in Romans 12, what does he say in Romans 12? Read this with us. Put this on us. Make this a memory verse for you. Romans 12, verse 14. The heading, by the way, in my Bible is marks of a true believer. Uh Uh-oh. Bless those who persecute you. No, I want to enforce justice. Bless and don't curse them. Well, sorry about that. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Uh Uh-oh. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself. Because, again... Avenging ourselves, keep a big picture of where we are. Never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Y'all, here's a hint. Jesus doesn't need you to defend his justice or to enforce his justice. He big enough? He can do it on his own. What he needs you to do is to reflect his mercy to a world that doesn't understand it. To a world who says, show no mercy, he needs believers to reflect an abundant 
overflowing picture of mercy. God doesn't call us to avenge his holiness, but to reflect his mercy. All right, so practically speaking, I'm going to wrap this up. Last question for you, maybe. Keep you on the edge of your seat. Last question. So practically, how do we do this? Practically speaking, how can we be more merciful? i got a couple thoughts for you. Number one, some of us consider this. Consider that we really haven't received this mercy. There are probably some of us in the, in the room who are not believers. Jesus tells us several stories about people who do stuff for him. But yet, at the end of the day, he goes, I didn't know you. Remember, it's not just an action. It's an attitude of the heart. So I would, I would implore you, right? Part of what, part of what um, kind of keeps me up at night sometimes as a, as, an, as a pastor, elder, a lay pastor of this church is, is Jesus tells us stories to, to get the point home that we can be spiritually deceived. There are people in our, in, in our congregation who believe they are believers and are not. And that false misunderstanding carries a great weight. And so I implore you, look, if it's hard to show mercy, at least consider, I, it's hard for me to show mercy because I don't realize this being forgiven. Like, I don't know what it feels like to experience the mercy of God. It's possible that we don't show mercy because we haven't experienced mercy. So if that's you, and if you're working through that picture of, man, I don't know what that feels like. I've been doing stuff for God, but I don't know that I know him, that I experience his just gracious compassion and pity for where I am. And if that's you, I would encourage you, find a believer. Come to me if you need to, but find a believer around you who has experienced this. If you're a believer, ask questions. Be ready to explain this to people. But number one, how do we show more pity? Number one, we got to realize that we need, we need the, how do we show more mercy? We got to recognize that we need mercy. And for those of us who haven't experienced it, I beg you, come to the foot of the cross. Jesus, I need your mercy. For those of us who are believers, I, I, for us, I would say this, preach the gospel to ourselves constantly. The gospel is not something that you learn at that point of conversion and you just go, sweet, I'm in the door. I know that I had sin. Jesus had to pay the price for my sin. And so he came, lived, and died on a cross for me. And then he rose three days later to beat the snot out of sin. And, um, and so that's, that's the gospel. But that's not just what I need for conversion. That's how we live every day. Because look, if I wake up in the morning and remind myself of the gospel, I remind myself of the great debt with which I've been forgiven. I remind myself of the great cost, not just in billions of dollars, the great cost that cost Jesus his life. I'm reminded of that when I remind my, when I preach the gospel to myself. I'm reminded of the great forgiveness, the compassion that comes from the heart of God. If I'm constantly preaching that to myself, do you know what happened? I started trying to go, okay, these crazy drivers, how do I, how do I, how do I get compassion on them? And the Lord started reminding me, he said, hey, you know how they cut in front of you and they're really like self-centered and they don't, they don't have any indicator, they're just unaware of what, of what the cost is for them to do that to you. They, they don't know what's going on. And then when you give them mercy, they don't even see the mercy. He said, hey, Kobe, that's the gospel, right? Before we knew God, God was ready, willing, and able to give us grace and mercy, right? And he, he has. We just didn't see it. I was like that clueless guy cutting people off. Like, just tootling along. I'm good. I don't need God. Right? And then God has given that to us. You know, preach the gospel to ourselves constantly. It's my challenge to us. Every day, preach the gospel to ourselves. Remind us of my need for that gospel. Then the final piece that I will leave or challenge you is seek the better kingdom. Right? Do you see these Beatitudes? But they don't make sense in this world. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the mercy. I dealt with this. I was like, lawyers. I was like, you, you see lawyers who are the strong arm, the hammer. But you don't see lawyers like Kobe the merciful. <laughs> People don't hire merciful lawyers. There are merciful lawyers out there. They usually lose. Um, <laughs> that's not true. But uh, there are merciful lawyers out there. That's true. 
Uh, the connection with them and losing is probably not true. I don't know. Um, but the point is this. The world doesn't see the Beatitudes. Like, it doesn't work with the world. Because we're not made for the world. So why are we seeking a world that we're not made for? Right? When we, when we seek revenge and vengeance, I mean, they owe me. Keep in mind, in that parable, the unmerciful servant had a legal debt. Like, he had a legal right to have, to have his grain of rice repaid. And Jesus said, look, that, that's not the economies of my kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven. But I get it. It's hard, right? Because the kingdom of this world doesn't understand this. I mean, here's, here's what I think happens. I think when we live our lives, if we're not preaching the gospel to ourselves constantly, we get distracted with the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of the world is all around us. Right? We, we live with constant reminders of, of you need to be successful. You need to have this. You need to drive this shiny vehicle. You need to uh, have these kind of friends. You need to post on this social media and take pictures of your food. Just brag to everybody. So we live in a world, a kingdom that is constantly speaking to you. You got these voices that are, that are painting the picture of the kingdom of the world. What voices are you hearing that are painting a picture of the kingdom of God? That's why we pray every day. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we consider what media we have. And what media are you looking at? Are you listening to music that reminds you of this great debt? Or looking at music, listening to music that says, hey, you deserve. You deserve this. Right? What voices are you listening to? Colossians 3 gets to the point, he says, set your minds on things above. I think that's where he's getting at. Seek the kingdom of heaven. And so, hey, practically, what does this look like? You know how when you start studying something, or you start looking at a new car, you start looking at a, I don't know, a Volkswagen bus or something, you start to see them all over the place? Right? What does it look like when we start to look for the kingdom? When we seek that kingdom all over the place. What does it look like? You know what I think it looks like? I think it looks like compassion for people. I think it looks like slowing down and having a genuine interest in people. The Lord gave us uh, a pretty, pretty big opportunity for this several weeks ago. Some of you have walked alongside my family through this, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, we've experienced uh, a member in our family as a victim of domestic violence and uh, several, several months ago. And uh, several weeks ago, though, um, and all evidence points to this one man as the, the, the perpetrator of that violence. Several weeks ago, though, of starting preparing for a sermon on mercy, several weeks ago, we're faced with the opportunity of sitting down with this person at a table for a meal. Like we have the opportunity to sit at a table with the perpetrator of domestic violence against a member of my family. Y'all, I don't want to do that. I knew the right answer was, we should, we should do that. And, uh, and so we took that action, right? Of sitting down across the table with someone that all, all the evidence points to, he's the perpetrator of violence against a, a very dear member of my family. The Lord enabled us to do that, I think in part, because of looking at that guy, right? His debt, even the debt he owes to me and to the member of my family that was harmed, the debt that he owes, little. Now look, I'm not taking domestic violence lightly. Please hear me. If you're in a situation of domestic violence, let's get you help and get out of it. That is a significant deal. But what I had to learn was his sin against me was little. He's got a bigger deal he's got to deal with, with my God. And here's what really got crazy. My debt with God, about the same. And there's a part of me, if I'm looking at the kingdom of this world, I look at that guy and I go, no, -uh, I'm way better than that dude. That dude doesn't deserve squat. When I back up and I have this kingdom of heaven perspective, I got to realize that my sin is that bad. That my God is that holy. And so I would implore you, what does this look like when we start to be merciful? It means people that don't deserve it, get it. It means that we start to examine our hearts of what do we deserve? What legal right are we entitled that we're pursuing that we need to use as an opportunity to display, be a mirror of God's mercy? 
Y'all, God's mercy is a big deal. I want you to see that. It impacts every part of our lives in big ways, and it doesn't fit in line with this kingdom of this world. You're going to look different. You're going to do some things that get questioned. But it's for a greater purpose, that purpose of demonstrating this beautiful picture of compassion, pity, forgiveness, looking on a sense of human depravity. God grants this abundant mercy. Chris and the guys, y'all come up here. Here's what I want to do. I want to close with just two passages of Scripture. I want us to stand, and I want us to read this together. It's from 1 Peter. And it really is just, it's an intro to, to 1 Peter. And Peter writes basically just a doxology. I want us to say this, and then we'll end with the beatitude that we're talking about today. 1 Peter 1, 3. Say this with me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to what? His great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then you know it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. God, we are so thankful for your mercy. God, I'm thankful for the picture that my debt carried such a great weight that you didn't just demand justice. Justice that I couldn't meet, God, but you you showed your nature of compassion and of love and of grace and of pity. And you looked on my heart and you forgave from the heart. And so, God, I pray that you would give us, this is hard, but God, I pray you give us opportunities today and tomorrow and the next day to be a mirror of your mercy to the world around us that's struggling under the weight of that same debt. Jesus, we love you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.